a billionaire named Charles Bennett, confined to the ICU, overhears his relatives plotting to rewrite his will. He decides to pretend to be dead, setting up a dramatic twist. Can he expose their greed in time, or will his relatives succeed? Before we get into the story, comment below where in the world you are watching from today, and if you like this story, don't forget to subscribe. Charles Bennett stood at the floor-to-ceiling window of his penthouse office, gazing out at the glittering city below. The view was breathtaking, but Charles felt nothing. At 65, he had amassed a fortune that most could only dream of, yet he was alone. With a deep sigh, Charles turned back to his desk. Another day, another series of meetings. He straightened his expensive tie and headed out, nodding briefly to his assistant. Mr. Bennett, don't forget your dinner with the board tonight, she reminded him. Charles paused. Right. Thank you, Sarah. Hours later, Charles emerged from the restaurant exhausted. The dinner had dragged on, filled with fake smiles and empty small talk. He longed for the quiet of his home. As he slid behind the wheel of his luxury car, Charles felt a familiar emptiness settle over him. The roads were quiet as he drove his mind wandering to the life he'd sacrificed for success. Suddenly, a blinding light filled his rearview mirror. Charles squinted, trying to see. The car behind him was speeding, weaving erratically. His heart raced as he realized the danger. Time seemed to slow down. Charles tried to steer out of the way, but it was too late. The impact was deafening. Metal crunched and glass shattered. Charles's world spun violently before everything went black. Sirens wailed in the distance, growing louder. Bystanders rushed to the crumpled vehicles, calling for help. Paramedics arrived quickly, working frantically to free the unconscious billionaire from the wreckage. Male mid-60s, severe head trauma, one paramedic shouted as they lifted Charles onto a stretcher. We need to move fast. As the ambulance raced through the night, Charles lay still, unaware of the chaos around him. His perfectly ordered world had been shattered in an instant, leaving him teetering between life and death. The emergency room buzzed with frantic activity as the paramedics rushed Charles through the sliding doors. Doctors and nurses swarmed around him, their voices urgent and focused. Get him to trauma one, stat, a doctor shouted, her eyes widening as she recognized the unconscious patient. In the operating room, the surgical team worked tirelessly to stabilize Charles. Hours ticked by as they battled to save his life. Finally, the lead surgeon stepped back, wiping sweat from his brow. He's stable but critical, he announced. Let's move him to ICU. As Charles lay motionless in the sterile hospital room, machines beeped steadily, monitoring his fragile condition. A nurse approached the bedside, her face etched with concern. Poor man, she murmured. Not a single visitor. Doesn't he have anyone? Her colleague shook her head. I checked his records, no immediate family listed, just some distant relatives. Well, we should contact them, the first nurse said. He shouldn't be alone at a time like this. Across the city in a lavish apartment, a phone rang. A woman answered, her voice groggy with sleep. Hello? Yes, this is Patricia Bennett. Her eyes widened as she listened. Charles? In the hospital? How serious is it? As the nurse explained the situation, Patricia's mind raced. She hadn't spoken to her wealthy cousin in years, but now, this could be the chance she'd been waiting for. Of course, we'll be right there, she said, feigning concern. As soon as she hung up, she dialed another number. Robert, it's Patricia. You need to get to City Hospital right away. It's Charles. This might be our opportunity. Within an hour, the hospital waiting room filled with people claiming to be Charles's family. They whispered among themselves, eyes darting towards the ICU doors. What do you think will happen if he doesn't make it? One man muttered. Shh, Robert, Patricia hissed. We need to look concerned. Remember, we're here because we care about Charles. The relatives huddled together in the sterile hospital waiting room, their faces a mask of concern. Dr. Harper, the lead physician, approached them with a clipboard in hand. Mr. Bennett's family, he asked, his voice low and serious. Patricia stepped forward, her eyes wide with feigned worry. 
Yes, doctor. How is our dear Charles? Dr. Harper sighed heavily. I'm afraid Mr. Bennett's condition is critical. He suffered severe injuries in the accident and is currently in the ICU fighting for his life. A collective gasp rose from the group, more theatrical than genuine. The next 24 to 48 hours will be crucial, Dr. Harper continued. We're doing everything we can, but I must warn you to prepare for the worst. Robert, Charles's second cousin, placed a comforting hand on Patricia's shoulder. Can we see him, doctor? I'm sorry, but visitors aren't allowed in the ICU at this time. We'll keep you updated on any changes in his condition. As Dr. Harper walked away, the relatives huddled closer, their voices dropping to whispers. This might be our chance, Robert murmured, his eyes darting around to make sure no one was listening. Patricia nodded, her face a mixture of excitement and caution. We need to act fast. If Charles doesn't make it... What about his will? Another relative chimed in. Do we know what it says? I heard he was planning to leave everything to charity, someone else added, their voice tinged with panic. Robert's eyes narrowed. We can't let that happen. There must be a way to change it. But how? Patricia hissed. We can't exactly waltz in there and make him sign a new one. The group fell silent, each lost in their own scheming thoughts. The beeping of machines and the hushed voices of hospital staff filled the air, a stark reminder of the gravity of the situation. What if... Robert began, his voice barely above a whisper. What if we could find a way to alter the existing will? The others leaned in closer, their eyes glinting with a mixture of fear and greed. It's risky, Patricia said, but her tone suggested she was considering the idea. But if we could pull it off... As they continued to plot in hushed tones, none of them noticed the nurse who had paused nearby, her eyes narrowing as she overheard snippets of their conversation. The steady beep of the heart monitor filled the dimly lit ICU room. Charles Bennett lay motionless, his face pale and bruised, surrounded by a tangle of tubes and wires. The doctors had done their best to stabilize him, but his condition remained critical. Suddenly, Charles's eyelids fluttered. A groan escaped his lips, barely audible over the hum of medical equipment. His mind felt foggy, like he was swimming through a thick soup of confusion. As he struggled to make sense of his surroundings, familiar voices drifted in from the hallway. At first, they were muffled, but as Charles's senses slowly sharpened, he could make out snippets of conversation. Change the will. All that money. Before it's too late? Charles's heart rate spiked, causing the monitor to beep more rapidly. He recognized those voices. They belonged to his relatives, the very people he had always kept at arm's length, sensing their ulterior motives. With great effort, Charles turned his head slightly towards the door, straining to hear more. The words that reached his ears sent a chill through his battered body. If we act now while he's out cold, we can make sure we get what's rightfully ours a voice that sounded like his cousin Robert's, said. But what if he wakes up? Patricia, his second cousin, whispered back. He won't, Robert replied coldly. And even if he does, it'll be too late. The realization hit Charles like a second car crash. His own family, the people who should have cared for him, were plotting to steal his legacy while he lay fighting for his life. The betrayal cut deep, leaving a wound far more painful than any physical injury. As the voices faded away, Charles felt a surge of determination course through him. He may have been weak, but he wasn't defeated. With every ounce of strength he could muster, he vowed to himself that he would survive this. He would recover and he would make sure his hard-earned fortune didn't fall into the hands of these greedy vultures. Charles's eyes closed again, exhaustion overtaking him. But even as he slipped back into unconsciousness, a plan began to form in the recesses of his mind. He would show them all what true strength and integrity looked like. As Charles slipped back into unconsciousness, his relatives continued their hushed conversation in the hallway, unaware that their sinister plot had been overheard. We need to act fast, Robert hissed, his eyes darting around to ensure no one was listening. The doctor said he might not make it through the night. Patricia nodded, her face a mask of false concern.
but how do we change the will without raising suspicion? I've got a friend who's a lawyer, Robert replied, a sly grin spreading across his face. He owes me a favor. We'll get him to draw up a new will, backdated to before the accident. And what about the other relatives? Patricia asked, wringing her hands nervously. Robert's eyes narrowed. We'll cut them out completely. It's every man for himself now. As they continued to scheme, a nurse approached, causing them to quickly plaster on looks of worry and grief. How's our dear uncle doing? Patricia asked, her voice dripping with fake concern. The nurse shook her head solemnly. I'm afraid there's been no change. His condition is still very critical. Robert placed a comforting hand on Patricia's shoulder, playing the part of the caring nephew. We're praying for a miracle, he said, his voice thick with false emotion. As soon as the nurse walked away, their faces hardened once more. See, Robert whispered, they don't expect him to pull through. We have the perfect opportunity. Patricia nodded, her earlier hesitation replaced by determination. You're right. Let's do this. As they walked away to put their plan into action, they remained blissfully unaware that the very man they sought to deceive had heard every word. In the quiet of his hospital room, Charles Bennett lay still, his body broken but his spirit undefeated, silently vowing to thwart their greedy ambitions. Charles's eyes fluttered open, the harsh hospital lights causing him to squint. The steady beep of the heart monitor filled the room, a constant reminder of his brush with death. Despite the fog of medication, his mind was clear, the memory of his relative's betrayal burning bright in his consciousness. He lay still, careful not to alert anyone to his newfound awareness. The weight of what he had overheard pressed heavily on his chest, more painful than any of his physical injuries. Charles had always known his relatives were distant, but he never imagined they would stoop so low. As he stared at the sterile white ceiling, Charles began to contemplate his next move. He knew he couldn't confront them directly, not yet. He needed time to plan, to ensure his legacy wouldn't fall into their greedy hands. For the first time in years, Charles felt truly alone. He had spent decades building his empire, pouring every ounce of energy into his work. Now, lying in a hospital bed with no one to genuinely care for him, the true cost of his choices became painfully clear. A nurse entered the room checking his vitals. Charles kept his eyes closed, maintaining the illusion of unconsciousness. As she adjusted his IV, he couldn't help but wonder if she would show him more genuine concern than his own flesh and blood. When the nurse left, Charles allowed himself a deep, shuddering sigh. Tears pricked at the corners of his eyes as he reflected on his life. He had achieved so much, but at what cost? His pursuit of success had left him with a fortune beyond measure, but no one to share it with. The irony wasn't lost on him. He had everything money could buy, yet he lacked the one thing it couldn't. True companionship. His relative's betrayal was a harsh wake-up call, forcing him to confront the emptiness of his existence. As he lay there, Charles made a silent vow. He would not only outsmart his deceitful relatives, but also use this second chance to make things right. It was time to reevaluate his priorities and find a way to leave a meaningful legacy. As the days passed, Charles regained his strength, all the while keeping up the facade of a weakened man. When he was finally alone, he reached for the phone beside his bed with trembling fingers. He dialed a number he knew by heart, his heart racing as he waited for an answer. Joanna, Charles whispered, his voice hoarse from disuse. It's me. I need your help. Joanna's warm, familiar voice filled him with relief. Mr. Bennett, I'm so glad to hear from you. How are you feeling? Charles took a deep breath, steeling himself for what he was about to share. Joanna, I've overheard something terrible. My relatives, they're planning to alter my will. They think I'm dying, and they want to take everything. There was a sharp intake of breath on the other end of the line. Oh, Mr. Bennett, Joanna said softly her voice filled with concern. I'm so sorry. What can I do to help? Tears welled up in Charles's eyes, touched by Joanna's genuine care. I need to protect my legacy, Joanna. Everything I've worked for, I can't let it fall into their hands. They don't understand the responsibility that comes with this wealth. 
Of course, Mr. Bennett, Joanna replied, her voice steady and reassuring. We'll figure this out together. Your legacy is important, and it deserves to be protected. Charles felt a weight lift from his shoulders. For the first time since the accident, he felt a glimmer of hope. Thank you, Joanna. I knew I could count on you. We need to come up with a plan, something to expose their true intentions and ensure my wealth is used for good. I'm with you every step of the way, Mr. Bennett, Joanna assured him. We'll make sure your legacy is secure and used to make a real difference in the world. As Charles ended the call, he felt a renewed sense of purpose. With Joanna by his side, he knew he could face whatever challenges lay ahead. It was time to turn this betrayal into an opportunity for redemption and positive change. With Joanna's unwavering support, Charles felt a renewed sense of purpose. The next day, Joanna arrived at the hospital, her face a mask of professional concern as she navigated past the relatives hovering in the hallway. Once inside Charles's room, she closed the door softly behind her. Mr. Bennett, she said warmly, her eyes shining with determination. I've contacted Mr. Holloway, your lawyer. He's ready to help us with whatever you need. Charles nodded, a small smile tugging at his lips. Thank you, Joanna. You've always been there for me. Together, they began to formulate a plan. Joanna took meticulous notes as Charles outlined his wishes, his voice growing stronger with each word. They would alter his will in secret, ensuring that his vast fortune would be channeled into charitable causes close to his heart. We'll set up a foundation, Charles explained, his eyes alight with purpose. It will focus on education for underprivileged children, medical research, and environmental conservation. Joanna nodded, her pen flying across the page. That's wonderful, Mr. Bennett. Your legacy will make a real difference in the world. As they worked, Charles felt a weight lifting from his shoulders. For years, he had focused solely on accumulating wealth, neglecting the joy of human connection. Now he was taking control of his legacy, transforming it into a force for good. Later that afternoon, Mr. Holloway arrived, his briefcase clutched tightly in his hand. The lawyer's eyes widened as Charles and Joanna shared the overheard plot and their counterplan. We'll need to be discreet, Mr. Holloway cautioned, his brow furrowed in concentration. But I assure you, Mr. Bennett, we can make this happen. Your wishes will be honored and your legacy protected. As the three of them worked late into the evening, Charles felt a sense of peace wash over him. He was no longer a passive victim of his relative's greed. Instead, he was actively shaping his future and the future of countless others who would benefit from his philanthropy. As the days passed, Charles's condition began to improve. The doctors were cautiously optimistic, noting his increased responsiveness and stronger vital signs. During this time, Charles, Joanna, and Mr. Holloway worked tirelessly to finalize the new will. In the quiet of Charles's hospital room, the three of them pored over documents discussing every detail with careful consideration. Charles's voice, though still weak, carried a newfound strength as he outlined his vision for the future. I want to make sure that every penny counts, Charles said, his eyes shining with determination. These charities will change lives. Joanna nodded, her heart swelling with pride for her boss and friend. We'll make sure of it, Mr. Bennett. Your generosity will touch so many people. Mr. Holloway carefully drafted the legal language, ensuring that Charles's wishes were clear and ironclad. The new will stipulated that the vast majority of Charles's wealth would be donated to a carefully selected group of charities focusing on education, health care, and environmental causes. As they reviewed the final draft, Charles turned to Joanna, his expression serious. Joanna? I'm entrusting you with overseeing the charitable foundation. You've been by my side for years, and I know you'll ensure my wishes are carried out. Joanna's eyes welled with tears. I'm honored, Mr. Bennett. I promise to do everything in my power to make your vision a reality. The weight of the moment settled over the room. Charles looked at the document before him, realizing the true importance of what they were doing. This wasn't just about thwarting his greedy relatives. It was about creating a lasting, positive impact on the world. You know, Charles said softly, 
I've spent my whole life chasing wealth and success, but it's only now that I understand what really matters. Joanna placed a comforting hand on his arm. It's never too late to make a difference, Mr. Bennett. With a deep breath, Charles picked up the pen. His hand trembled slightly as he signed his name, but his resolve was unwavering. As the ink dried on the paper, Charles felt a profound sense of peace wash over him. He had safeguarded his legacy, ensuring that his life's work would continue to make a difference long after he was gone. With the new will securely in place, Charles felt a sense of relief wash over him. However, he knew his work wasn't done yet. There was still one more crucial step to take in his plan to expose his relative's true nature and protect his legacy. Charles reached for his phone and dialed a familiar number. After a few rings, a warm, reassuring voice answered, Dr. Harper speaking. Michael, it's Charles. I need to talk to you about something important. Can you come to my room? Charles's voice was low and serious. Dr. Michael Harper, Charles's longtime friend and personal physician, arrived at the hospital room within minutes. He closed the door behind him, his face etched with concern. What's going on, Charles? Are you feeling all right? Hey, man. Charles took a deep breath and looked his friend in the eye. I'm fine, Michael, but I need your help with something unusual. As Charles explained his plan to stage his own death, Dr. Harper's eyes widened in disbelief. He listened intently, his medical mind already considering the implications and logistics of such a scheme. Charles, are you sure about this? Dr. Harper asked, his voice filled with concern. It's a drastic step. Charles nodded solemnly. I've never been more certain of anything in my life, Michael. You should have heard them plotting, thinking I was unconscious. I need to expose their true colors and make sure they don't get a penny of my fortune. Dr. Harper sat quietly for a moment, weighing the ethical implications of what Charles was asking. Finally, he spoke, his voice soft but resolute. All right, Charles, I'll help you, but we need to be extremely careful. This isn't just about fooling your relatives. We have to consider the legal and moral consequences. Relief flooded Charles's face. Thank you, Michael. I knew I could count on you. Together, they began to hash out the details of their plan. Dr. Harper would declare Charles dead due to complications from his injuries, while in reality, Charles would be moved to a secure, private facility to recover. As they talked, Charles felt a mix of excitement and apprehension. He knew the path ahead would be challenging, but he was determined to see it through. With Dr. Harper's help, he would finally uncover the truth about his relatives and ensure his wealth would be used for good. Dr. Harper took a deep breath as he stepped out of Charles's room. The weight of their plan rested heavily on his shoulders. He straightened his white coat and made his way to the waiting area where Charles's relatives sat, their faces a mix of concern and barely concealed anticipation. I'm afraid I have some bad news, Dr. Harper announced, his voice grave. The relatives leaned forward, their eyes wide. Mr. Bennett's condition has taken a turn for the worse. We're doing everything we can, but I'm sorry to say he's not expected to survive much longer. A chorus of gasps and murmurs filled the room. Dr. Harper watched closely as the relatives' expressions shifted from shock to poorly disguised excitement. Oh, poor Charles, one of the cousins said, dabbing at dry eyes with a handkerchief. He was always so dedicated to his work. Yes, such a tragedy, another relative chimed in already pulling out his phone. We should start making arrangements, shouldn't we? For... after. Dr. Harper nodded solemnly. Of course. I understand this is a difficult time. Please, take all the time you need to prepare. As Dr. Harper turned to leave, he could hear the hushed whispers of the relatives behind him. Their true colors were already beginning to show. Back in Charles's room, the billionaire lay still in his bed. His eyes closed, but his ears straining to catch every word Dr. Harper would relay to him. It's done, Dr. Harper said quietly as he entered. They bought it hook, line, and sinker. Charles opened his eyes, a mix of sadness and determination in his gaze. Thank you, Michael. I hate that it's come to this, but they've left me no choice. Outside, the relatives huddled together, their voices low but excited. We need to move quickly, the eldest cousin said before anyone else tries to claim what's rightfully ours. I've already called my lawyer, another added. 
He's drawing up the papers as we speak. As they plotted and schemed, none of them noticed Joanna, Charles's loyal secretary, quietly observing from a distance. Her heart heavy with the knowledge of their true nature, she silently reaffirmed her commitment to helping Charles protect his legacy. From his hidden vantage point, Charles watched as his relatives gathered in the hospital's private waiting room. His heart sank as he observed their true colors emerging, the facade of concern crumbling away to reveal their naked greed. I think we should discuss how we're going to divide Charles's estate, his cousin Robert said, barely waiting for the door to close behind Dr. Harper. Divide? Aunt Mildred scoffed, her bony fingers clutching her designer purse. I practically raised that boy. I deserve the lion's share. Charles felt a pang in his chest. He remembered the handful of awkward holiday dinners at Aunt Mildred's house, but raised was a gross exaggeration. You, please, his nephew Timothy sneered. When was the last time you even spoke to Uncle Charles? I've been to his office at least twice in the past year. Oh yes, begging for money, no doubt, Robert shot back. The room erupted into a cacophony of raised voices and pointed fingers. Charles watched in disbelief as his relatives, people he had hoped might have at least a shred of genuine affection for him, bickered like children over toys. I should get the vacation home in Aspen, Timothy declared. I'm the only one who actually skis. Over my dead body, Aunt Mildred shrieked. That house would be wasted on you. I could host the most fabulous parties there. Charles felt a mixture of sadness and anger bubbling up inside him. These people, his so-called family, were already divvying up his possessions while he was supposedly on his deathbed. There wasn't a single mention of his legacy, his charitable work, or even a moment of genuine grief. What about his company? Robert asked, a greedy glint in his eye. That's where the real money is. Huh? None of you know the first thing about running a business? Timothy scoffed. I have an MBA. Clearly, I should take over. As the arguments grew more heated, Charles had to resist the urge to burst into the room and confront them. He clenched his fists, his knuckles turning white with the effort of restraining himself. Dr. Harper and Joanna huddled together in his office, their faces etched with determination. They knew the gravity of what they were about to do, but their loyalty to Charles steeled their resolve. Are you sure about this, Joanna? Dr. Harper asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Joanna nodded, her eyes shining with unshed tears. It's what Charles wants. We have to protect his legacy. Dr. Harper sighed and pulled out a blank death certificate. With a steady hand, he began filling it out, pausing only to double-check the details with Joanna. When he was done, he held it up, the official-looking document now declaring Charles Bennett deceased. It's done, he said softly. Joanna took a deep breath. Now comes the hard part. In th they made their way to the waiting room where Charles's relatives were still arguing. As they entered, a hush fell over the room. Dr. Harper cleared his throat, his face a mask of professional sorrow. I'm afraid I have some terrible news, he began. Despite our best efforts, Mr. Bennett passed away a few minutes ago. I'm so sorry for your loss. The relatives' reactions were a study in poor acting. Aunt Mildred let out a wail that sounded more like a cat in heat than genuine grief. Timothy buried his face in his hands, but his shoulders shook with what looked suspiciously like laughter rather than sobs. Robert simply stood there, a gleam in his eye that he couldn't quite hide. Oh, poor Charles, Aunt Mildred cried, dabbing at her dry eyes with a lace handkerchief. He was like a son to me. We're all devastated, Robert added, his voice flat and unconvincing. What happens now? Joanna stepped forward, her face a perfect mask of professional composure. As Mr. Bennett's personal assistant, I'll be handling the immediate arrangements. We'll need to discuss the will and estate matters soon, but for now let's focus on honoring Charles's memory. The relatives nodded solemnly, but Joanna could see the calculating looks they exchanged. She knew they were already plotting their next moves, eager to get their hands on Charles's fortune. As Dr. Harper and Joanna left the room, they shared a knowing glance. The plan was in motion, and soon, Charles's true intentions would be revealed.
The relatives gathered in a plush office, their eyes gleaming with barely concealed greed. They had wasted no time in setting up a meeting with a lawyer, eager to get their hands on Charles's fortune. The lawyer, a stern-looking man named Mr. Daniels, sat behind a large mahogany desk, his face unreadable. We're here to discuss Charles Bennett's will, Robert began, leaning forward in his chair. As his closest family members, we believe there might have been some oversights in the current document. Mr. Daniels raised an eyebrow. Oversights? Could you elaborate? Aunt Mildred chimed in, her voice syrupy sweet. Well, you see, dear Charles always meant to leave us a significant portion of his estate. He just never got around to updating the will. We were so close, you understand. Timothy nodded vigorously. Absolutely. He promised me his yacht just last month. It's a shame he didn't put it in writing. Mr. Daniels listened attentively, making notes on a legal pad. What the relatives didn't know was that every word they spoke was being recorded and would later be used as evidence of their deceit. I see, Mr. Daniels said carefully. And you're all in agreement about these changes? The relatives exchanged quick glances before nodding in unison. Excellent, Mr. Daniels continued. Now, let's discuss the specifics of what you'd like to alter in the will. For the next hour, the relatives took turns describing their rightful inheritances. Robert wanted control of Charles's company. Aunt Mildred laid claim to his real estate holdings. Timothy insisted on receiving all of Charles's vehicles and his prized art collection. Mr. Daniels diligently took notes, asking probing questions that the relatives eagerly answered, not realizing they were incriminating themselves further with each word. Well, Mr. Daniels said finally, closing his notebook, this has been most illuminating. I'll draw up the necessary paperwork, and we'll meet again to finalize everything. The relatives left the office, congratulating themselves on their cleverness. Little did they know that Mr. Daniels immediately picked up the phone to call Joanna, ready to report on the success of their deception. As the relatives left Mr. Daniels' office, feeling triumphant and eager to claim their ill-gotten gains, Joanna and Charles watched from a hidden room, their faces grim with disappointment and resolve. Charles shook his head, his eyes filled with sadness. I can't believe they would go this far, he murmured, his voice heavy with emotion. All these years I thought they at least cared a little. Joanna placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. I'm so sorry, Charles. It must be heartbreaking to see them like this. Charles nodded, taking a deep breath to steady himself. It is, but it also strengthens my resolve. We need to make sure they don't get away with this. Nanette. Together, they listened to the recording of the meeting, cringing at each greedy demand made by the relatives. Charles felt a mix of anger and sorrow wash over him as he heard his family members argue over his possessions as if he were already gone. They didn't even mention using any of the money for charity, Charles said his voice barely above a whisper. Not a single thought for anyone but themselves. Joanna nodded, her face set with determination. Which is exactly why we're doing this, Charles. Your legacy will help so many people, not line the pockets of these, these vultures. As they continued to monitor the relatives' actions, Charles and Joanna worked tirelessly behind the scenes. They coordinated with Mr. Daniels, ensuring that every incriminating statement was properly documented. They also began preparations for the big reveal, when Charles would finally confront his greedy family members. Despite the pain of witnessing his relatives' true nature, Charles felt a growing sense of purpose. He knew that exposing their greed would not only protect his fortune, but also ensure it would be used for good. With each passing day, his resolve strengthened, and he became more certain that he was doing the right thing. As the days passed, the relatives began to put their plan into motion. They met with Mr. Daniels, the lawyer they believed was on their side, to discuss the changes they wanted to make to Charles's will. Their voices were hushed and their eyes darted around nervously as they spoke. We need to be careful, whispered Aunt Martha, her bony fingers clutching her purse. We can't make it too obvious. Uncle Robert nodded in agreement. Yes, yes, just small changes here and there nothing that would raise suspicion. Mr. Daniels listened attentively, taking notes and offering suggestions. 
Little did the relatives know, every word they spoke was being recorded and would later be used against them. Meanwhile, Charles and Joanna continued to monitor the situation from their secret location. They listened to every conversation, their hearts heavy with disappointment, but their resolve stronger than ever. I can't believe how calculated they're being, Charles said, shaking his head. They're actually trying to make it look legitimate. Joanna squeezed his hand reassuringly. That's why we need to be patient, Charles. We need to let them dig their own grave. As the relatives worked on their scheme, they began to feel more confident. They discussed how they would divide Charles's fortune among themselves, their eyes gleaming with greed. I've always wanted that summer house in the Hamptons, cousin Sarah said, her voice filled with excitement. Now it'll finally be mine. The others nodded eagerly, each envisioning the wealth they would soon possess. But beneath their excitement, a thread of nervousness remained. They knew they were treading on dangerous ground. Charles and Joanna watched and waited, gathering evidence and preparing for the moment when they would reveal the truth. Despite the pain of seeing his family's true colors, Charles felt a sense of purpose growing within him. He knew that exposing their greed would ensure his fortune would be used for good, just as he had always intended. As the days wore on, the relatives grew bolder in their scheming. They held clandestine meetings in dimly lit rooms, their voices low and urgent as they finalized their plans to alter Charles's will. We're so close, Aunt Martha whispered, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. Just a few more tweaks and we'll have it all. Uncle Robert nodded, a sly smile spreading across his face. I can almost taste the champagne we'll be drinking when this is all over. The group huddled around a coffee table strewn with papers poring over the details of their plan. They argued in hushed tones about percentages and properties, each fighting for their share of the imagined windfall. Remember, Cousin Sarah hissed, we need to keep some of his charitable donations intact. It'll look suspicious if we cut them all out. The others grumbled but agreed. They were so focused on their scheme that they failed to notice the small blinking light of a hidden camera in the corner of the room. Miles away in a secure location, Charles and Joanna watched the feed from that camera. Charles's face was a mask of pain and determination as he listened to his relatives' plot and scheme. I can't believe they're going through with this, he murmured, shaking his head. Joanna placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. I know it hurts, Charles, but remember why we're doing this. Your legacy will be protected. Charles nodded, his jaw set. You're right. We have to see this through. As they watched, Joanna made careful notes of every incriminating statement, every greedy declaration. They were building an airtight case against the relatives, preparing for the moment when they would reveal the truth. Back in the meeting room, the relatives were putting the finishing touches on their plan. They had no idea that their every move was being monitored, that their words were being recorded and catalogued. Tomorrow... Uncle Robert declared, We'll meet with Mr. Daniels and make these changes official. Then, my friends, we'll be set for life. The group raised their glasses in a toast, celebrating their imminent victory. Little did they know that their dreams of wealth were about to come crashing down around them. The relatives gathered in the opulent living room of Charles's mansion, their eyes gleaming with anticipation. They had spent weeks meticulously altering the will, and now they were ready to file it officially. Can you believe it? Aunt Martha exclaimed, clapping her hands together. We're about to be filthy rich. Uncle Robert nodded, a smug smile spreading across his face. I've already picked out the yacht I'm going to buy. It's a beauty, a hundred feet long with all the bells and whistles. Cousin Sarah lounged on the leather sofa, scrolling through her phone. I'm thinking of buying a villa in the south of France, maybe two actually one for summer and one for winter. The group chuckled, their laughter echoing through the room. They were so caught up in their fantasies that they didn't notice the small camera hidden in the potted plant in the corner. What about you, George? Uncle Robert asked, turning to the youngest of the group. What are you going to do with your share? George shrugged, a dreamy look in his eyes. I'm going to quit my job and travel the world. First class all the way, of course. As they continued to plan their lavish futures, Charles watched from a hidden room, 
his face a mix of disgust and determination. Joanna stood beside him, taking notes on everything the relatives said. Look at them, Charles muttered, shaking his heed. They haven't even filled the will yet, and they're already spending my money. Joanna patted his arm sympathetically. Don't worry, Charles. They'll get what's coming to them soon enough. Back in the living room, the relatives were now discussing the logistics of filing the altered will. I've made an appointment with Mr. Daniels for tomorrow morning, Aunt Martha announced. Once we file this will, it'll all be official. The others nodded in agreement, raising their glasses in a toast. To our new lives, they cheered, completely unaware that their dreams were about to come crashing down around them. The relatives gathered in Charles's expansive study, surrounded by dark wood paneling and leather-bound books. Aunt Martha stood by the fireplace, her eyes gleaming with excitement. We need to make this funeral grand, she declared. It's our chance to show everyone that we're Charles's true family. Uncle Robert nodded, stroking his chin thoughtfully. Agreed. We'll spare no expense. After all, it's coming out of his pocket, not ours. Cousin Sarah perked up, her face lighting up with an idea. Oh, we should invite all the big names in the business world. It'll make us look important and connected. Brilliant, Aunt Martha exclaimed. She turned to George, who was slouched in an armchair. George, dear, start making a list of all the CEOs and politicians we can invite. George sighed, but obediently pulled out his phone and began typing. The others huddled around a large desk, poring over catalogs of expensive floral arrangements and catering menus. We'll need the fanciest coffin money can buy, Uncle Robert mused. And maybe we can hire a famous singer for the service. As they planned, their voices grew more animated, their excitement palpable. They were so caught up in their scheming that they didn't notice the slight creak of the door or the flash of a camera lens. This funeral will be the talk of the town, Aunt Martha said, her eyes shining. Everyone will see us as Charles's devoted family, the natural inheritors of his legacy. The others nodded in agreement, their faces flushed with anticipation. They had no idea that their elaborate plans were about to backfire spectacularly. The day of Charles Bennett's funeral dawned bright and clear, a stark contrast to the somber mood that hung over the Grand Cathedral. Black limousines lined the street, disgorging a steady stream of well-dressed mourners. Inside, the cathedral was a sea of black suits and dresses. Enormous floral arrangements filled the air with their sweet scent. At the front, a gleaming mahogany casket stood surrounded by wreaths and portraits of Charles. Aunt Martha dabbed at her eyes with a lace handkerchief as she greeted guests. Thank you so much for coming, she murmured, her voice thick with fake emotion. Charles meant the world to us. Uncle Robert stood nearby, shaking hands with CEOs and politicians. Charles was like a brother to me, he said, his voice catching. We're devastated by this loss. As the service began, the relatives took their seats in the front row. They listened with bowed heads as speaker after speaker praised Charles's business acumen and generosity. Cousin Sarah even managed to squeeze out a few tears during a particularly moving eulogy. The cathedral was packed to capacity, with many people standing in the back. Cameras flashed as reporters captured the scene for the evening news. The relatives basked in the attention, certain that their performance had convinced everyone of their deep connection to Charles. As the service drew to a close, Uncle Robert stood to deliver the family's final words. He cleared his throat and gazed out at the sea of faces. Charles was more than just a successful businessman, he began his voice quavering. He was a beloved member of our family. We promise to honor his memory by continuing his legacy of philanthropy. As the funeral ceremony began, Charles Bennett watched from a hidden alcove near the back of the cathedral. His heart raced as he observed the solemn proceedings, knowing that soon he would reveal the truth to everyone. Through a small opening, Charles could see his relatives seated in the front row. Aunt Martha dabbed at her eyes with a handkerchief, while Uncle Robert sat with his head bowed, the picture of grief. Cousin Sarah sniffled quietly, her shoulders shaking with apparent sobs. Charles felt a mix of emotions wash over him. Anger at their deceit, sadness at the betrayal, and a steely determination to expose their true nature. <laughs>
he took a deep breath, trying to calm his nerves. As the first speaker approached the podium, Charles listened intently. The words of praise for his life's work and generosity rang hollow, knowing that his own family had tried to steal it all away. If only they knew, Charles thought, his jaw clenching. He watched as his relatives nodded along with the eulogies, their faces masks of sorrow. But Charles could see through their act now. Every tear, every somber nod was just another lie. The ceremony continued and Charles felt his resolve strengthen. He knew that in just a few moments he would step out and shock everyone in attendance. The thought both terrified and exhilarated him. As Uncle Robert stood to deliver the family's final words, Charles prepared himself. He straightened at his tie and took one last deep breath. The moment of truth was almost here. As the funeral proceeded, the atmosphere in the cathedral grew increasingly somber. The relatives sat in the front row, their faces etched with well-practiced grief. They nodded solemnly as speaker after speaker praised Charles's life and accomplishments. Then Joanna stepped up to the podium. Her eyes were red-rimmed, but there was a quiet strength in her posture. She cleared her throat and began to speak, her voice soft but clear. Charles Bennett was more than just my employer, she started. He was a visionary, a mentor, and above all, a friend. The attendees leaned forward, captivated by the sincerity in Joanna's words. She spoke of Charles's tireless work ethic, his innovative business strategies, and his unwavering commitment to making the world a better place. But what truly set Charles apart, Joanna continued, her voice growing stronger, was his dedication to philanthropy. He believed that true wealth lay not in bank accounts, but in the positive impact one could make on others' lives. As Joanna shared stories of Charles's charitable endeavors, many in the audience were moved to tears. She spoke of the hospitals he had funded, the schools he had built in underprivileged areas, and the countless lives he had touched through his generosity. Charles often told me, Joanna said, her voice thick with emotion, that his greatest wish was to leave the world better than he found it. He worked tirelessly towards this goal, often at the expense of his own personal life. The relatives shifted uncomfortably in their seats, their faces a mix of feigned sorrow and growing unease. Joanna's words were shining a light on Charles's true character making their own shallow pretenses seem even more glaring in contrast. In his final days, Joanna continued, Charles's thoughts were not of his wealth or his business empire. They were of the good he could still do, the lives he could still change. His legacy is not one of mere financial success, but of compassion, generosity, and a genuine desire to make a difference. As Joanna concluded her speech, a hush fell over the cathedral. The attendees were visibly moved, many wiping tears from their eyes. They had come to see Charles Bennett in a new light, not just as a successful businessman, but as a truly remarkable human being. As Joanna finished her heartfelt speech, a hush fell over the cathedral. The attendees sat in reverent silence, reflecting on the life and legacy of Charles Bennett. Suddenly the sound of footsteps echoed through the cavernous space. All heads turned towards the entrance and gasps of shock rippled through the crowd. There, standing tall and very much alive, was Charles Bennett himself. Charles walked slowly down the aisle, his face a mask of determination. The silence in the room was deafening, broken only by the soft taps of his shoes on the marble floor. As he approached the front of the cathedral, the relatives' faces drained of color. Their eyes widened in horror as the realization dawned on them. Their scheme had been exposed. Charles stopped at the foot of his own casket, turning to face the stunned audience. His gaze swept over the crowd, lingering for a moment on his relatives, who seemed to shrink under his scrutiny. As you can see, Charles said, his voice strong and clear, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. A collective gasp rose from the attendees. Some rubbed their eyes in disbelief, while others whispered frantically to their neighbors. The relatives sat frozen in their seats, their faces a mix of shock, fear, and embarrassment. Charles's eyes met Joanna's and she gave him a small, encouraging nod. He took a deep breath and addressed the crowd once more. I apologize for this deception, he said, his voice tinged with both regret and resolve. 
but recent events made it necessary for me to take drastic measures to protect my legacy and ensure that my wealth would be used as I intended. The relatives squirmed in their seats, their faces growing redder by the second. They knew without a doubt that their plot had been uncovered. The weight of their actions crashed down upon them as they realized the full extent of their betrayal. Charles stepped onto the stage, his eyes fixed on his relatives. The room fell silent, hanging on his every word. I'm sure you're all wondering why I went to such lengths, Charles began, his voice steady but filled with emotion. The truth is, I needed to know who I could trust. He paused, letting his gaze sweep over his relatives. They squirmed under his scrutiny, their faces a mix of fear and shame. While I lay in the ICU fighting for my life, I overheard something that broke my heart, Charles continued. My own flesh and blood, plotting to alter my will and steal my fortune. Gasps of shock echoed through the cathedral. The relatives sank lower in their seats, their faces burning with embarrassment. I heard every word, Charles said, his voice cracking slightly. Every selfish thought, every greedy plan. It was then that I realized I needed to test their true intentions. He turned to address the crowd directly. I've spent my life building my fortune, but I always intended it to be used for good. To help those in need, not to line the pockets of those who only pretended to care about me. Charles's words cut through the air like a knife. The relatives looked around nervously, aware that all eyes were now on them. So I devised this plan, Charles explained. I wanted to see how far they would go, how low they would stoop. And sadly, they didn't disappoint. He recounted the events of the past few days, detailing how his relatives had schemed and plotted, believing him to be dead. With each revelation, the assembled guests shook their heads in disbelief and disgust. I stand before you today not just to expose their deceit, Charles said, his voice growing stronger but to remind us all of the importance of integrity and genuine care for others. The relatives, unable to meet anyone's gaze, sat in stunned silence as Charles laid bare their greed and betrayal. The weight of their actions hung heavy in the air, a stark contrast to the generosity and kindness Charles had always shown. As Charles's words hung in the air, a wave of shock and disgust rippled through the crowd. The guests, many of whom were prominent figures in business and philanthropy, turned to stare at the relatives with open contempt. Whispers of disbelief and anger filled the room. Charles took a deep breath, his eyes shining with determination. But this experience has taught me something valuable, he continued. It's shown me the true importance of using my wealth for good. He gestured to Joanna, who stepped forward with a document in her hands. I've made a decision, Charles announced, his voice strong and clear. I will be donating the majority of my fortune to charity. A collective gasp echoed through the cathedral, followed by a swell of applause. The guests rose to their feet, their faces beaming with admiration and respect for Charles's generosity. My wealth will go towards funding education for underprivileged children, supporting medical research, and providing aid to communities in need, Charles explained, a warm smile spreading across his face. This is the legacy I want to leave behind, one of kindness, compassion, and hope for a better world. As Charles spoke about his plans, the relatives sank lower in their seats. Their faces were a mix of shock, shame, and regret. They couldn't meet the eyes of those around them, painfully aware of how their greed had been exposed. I hope that my actions will inspire others to use their resources for the greater good, Charles said, his voice filled with emotion. We all have the power to make a difference no matter how big or small. The applause grew louder, drowning out any attempt the relatives might have made to defend themselves. They sat in stunned silence, the weight of their actions crushing down on them as they realized the magnitude of what they had lost. Not just the money, but also their dignity and the respect of everyone in the room. As the applause died down, Charles turned to face his relatives. His eyes, once filled with warmth, now held a mix of disappointment and resolve. I'm sorry, he said, his voice firm but tinged with sadness. But I can no longer consider you family. The relatives' faces paled, their eyes widening in shock. They had never imagined their scheme would backfire so spectacularly.
Your actions have shown me that you care only for my wealth, not for me, Charles continued. From this moment on, you have no claim to my fortune or my name. A murmur rippled through the crowd. Many nodded in agreement, their faces showing approval of Charles's decision. Joanna stepped forward, holding up a legal document. This revised will, she announced, officially removes all mentions of these individuals as beneficiaries. They will receive nothing. The relatives' expressions crumbled. Some began to protest, but their words were drowned out by the disapproving mutters of the guests. How could you? One guest called it out. Shame on you, shouted another. Red-faced and trembling, the relatives rose from their seats. They looked around desperately, seeking any hint of sympathy, but found none. The eyes that met theirs were filled with disgust and contempt. As they stumbled towards the side of the hall, whispers followed them. Greedy vultures, someone hissed. They got what they deserved, another agreed. With each step, the weight of their actions seemed to press down on them. By the time they reached the doors, their shoulders were slumped in defeat. They slipped out into the bright sunlight, leaving behind the murmurs of the shocked crowd and the ruins of their reputations. As the last of the guests filtered out of the funeral hall, Charles stood alone, his emotions a tumultuous mix of relief and sadness. The weight of the day's events pressed heavily on his shoulders. He took a deep breath, savoring the quiet after the storm of revelations. Suddenly, the sound of hesitant footsteps broke the silence. Charles turned to see his relatives approaching, their faces etched with shame and regret. Their eyes, once filled with greed, now brimmed with tears. Charles, his cousin Sarah began, her voice trembling. We were so sorry. What we did was unforgivable. Uncle Robert, usually boisterous and confident, now looked small and defeated. We let our greed blind us, he admitted, his gaze fixed on the floor. We forgot what family truly means. Charles watched them, his heart conflicted. He saw the genuine remorse in their eyes, the slump of their shoulders heavy with the weight of their actions. After a moment of tense silence, Charles spoke. His voice was soft but firm. What you did hurt me deeply, he said. You betrayed my trust and tried to take advantage of what you thought was my death. The relatives flinched at his words, but Charles continued. However, I can see that you're truly sorry. And because of that, I forgive you. A collective gasp escaped from the group. They hadn't dared hope for forgiveness. But, Charles added, his tone growing serious, this forgiveness doesn't mean things can go back to how they were. You will no longer be involved in my business or my personal life. I've moved on, and you need to do the same. Aunt Martha stepped forward, her eyes pleading. But Charles, we're family. Surely we can... Charles held up his hand, stopping her mid-sentence. Family is more than just blood, he said gently. It's about trust, love, and respect. Those bonds take time to rebuild, if they can be rebuilt at all. The relatives nodded slowly, understanding the finality of Charles's decision. They could see that their actions had severed ties that might never be fully repaired. I wish you all the best, Charles said, his voice softening slightly. I hope you learn from this and find a better path forward. In the days following the dramatic funeral, Charles and Joanna threw themselves into the task of implementing the new will. The spacious office that had once been filled with the buzz of business deals now hummed with a different kind of energy, one of hope and purpose. Charles sat at his desk, poring over documents detailing various charitable causes. His eyes, once tired from endless profit calculations, now sparkled with enthusiasm as he envisioned the positive changes his wealth could bring. Joanna, he called out, what do you think about this education initiative? Joanna walked over, her arms full of folders. She leaned in to look at the paper Charles was holding. It looks promising, Charles. Providing scholarships to underprivileged children could change so many lives. Charles nodded, a warm smile spreading across his face. That's exactly what I was thinking. Let's make it a priority. As they worked, Charles couldn't help but feel a sense of fulfillment he had never experienced before. Each decision they made, each initiative they planned, felt like a step towards leaving a lasting, positive mark on the world. Joanna noticed the change in Charles, 
His shoulders, once tense with the weight of his empire, now seemed relaxed. There was a lightness in his step and a genuine joy in his eyes that she had never seen before. You know, Joanna, Charles said softly, looking up from his work, I never realized how empty success could feel until now. This, this feels right. Joanna smiled warmly. It's wonderful to see you like this, Charles. Your generosity will touch so many lives. They continued working late into the evening, planning initiatives for health care, environmental conservation, and community development. With each passing hour, Charles felt more certain that this was his true calling, using his wealth to make a real difference in the world. As the sun began to set, casting a warm glow through the office windows, Charles and Joanna stood back and looked at the wall covered in plans and ideas. It was a visual representation of the positive change they were about to set in motion. Charles turned to Joanna, his eyes shining with determination. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, he said, but I've never been more excited about anything in my life. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Charles found himself standing by the large window in his office, gazing out at the city lights. The events of the past few weeks played through his mind like a vivid movie. He thought about the accident, the betrayal of his relatives, and the elaborate plan he had executed with the help of Joanna and Dr. Harper. A warm feeling spread through his chest as he considered the unwavering loyalty and support these two individuals had shown him. They had stood by his side through thick and thin, risking their own reputations to help him expose the truth and protect his legacy. Charles turned away from the window and walked over to his desk. He picked up a framed photo of himself with Joanna and Dr. Harper, taken at a charity event years ago. He had never paid much attention to it before, but now he studied their smiling faces with newfound appreciation. I've been such a fool, he murmured to himself, shaking his head. Charles realized that while he had spent years building his fortune, he had neglected to invest in the most valuable asset of all, genuine relationships. Joanna and Dr. Harper had proven to be more precious than any business deal or financial success he had ever achieved. With a deep sigh, Charles made a decision. He would no longer take these relationships for granted. He vowed to dedicate more time to nurturing these connections, to show Joanna and Dr. Harper how much their friendship meant to him. He picked up his phone and dialed Joanna's number. When she answered, he said, Joanna, I was wondering if you'd like to join me for dinner tomorrow evening. Not for work, just as friends. The surprise in Joanna's voice was evident, but her response was warm and enthusiastic. I'd love to, Charles. That sounds wonderful. After hanging up, Charles felt a sense of excitement he hadn't experienced in years. He realized that true wealth wasn't measured in dollars and cents, but in the love and loyalty of those who genuinely cared for him. With this new understanding, Charles looked forward to a future filled not just with financial success, but with rich, meaningful relationships. As the weeks passed, Charles threw himself into his charitable work with renewed vigor. He worked closely with Joanna to establish several new initiatives, focusing on education, health care, and environmental conservation. The joy he found in giving back to the community was unlike anything he had experienced in his years of amassing wealth. One balmy evening, Charles found himself attending a charity gala for one of his new foundations. The grand ballroom was filled with people from all walks of life, volunteers, beneficiaries, and supporters of the cause. As he made his way through the crowd, Charles was struck by the genuine warmth and appreciation he received. Mr. Bennett, thank you for funding our school's science program, a young teacher said, her eyes shining with gratitude. You've changed so many lives. Charles smiled, feeling a lump form in his throat. It's my pleasure, he replied softly. The real thanks go to dedicated educators like yourself. As he continued to mingle, Charles was approached by Dr. Harper, who had become a close friend since the hospital incident. Charles, my friend, Dr. Harper said, clapping him on the shoulder. It's wonderful to see you here making a real difference. Charles looked around the room, taking in the smiling faces and the buzz of excited conversation. He saw Joanna across the room, deep in discussion with a group of volunteers. She caught his eye and gave him a warm smile and a thumbs up.
In that moment, Charles felt a deep sense of contentment wash over him. He realized that he was surrounded by people who appreciated him for who he was, not for his money or status. The connections he had formed, the lives he had touched, these were the true measures of his success. As he stood there, Charles knew with certainty that his legacy was secure. Not in the form of buildings bearing his name or vast sums of money, but in the positive impact he had made on countless lives. He had found a wealth far greater than anything he had accumulated in his bank accounts. A wealth of love, friendship, and purpose. Would you forgive your relatives if they plotted against you like Charles's relatives did? Yes or no? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear your perspective. And if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to my channel. I am spending hours upon hours writing these heartwarming stories for you, and your support is what keeps me going.